Hi everyone, I'm uh, Dana, um, and uh, I'm a data scientist in Olytics, uh, which is a startup in the field of healthcare. And what we're trying to do is to provide a monitoring solution uh, for elderly people. So, for example, we predict if uh, someone has fallen, uh, dehydration, or all kind of abnormal scenarios. So, this is how our systems uh, look like. So, you can see the watch I'm wearing here. It's the one in the picture. We have all kind of uh, smart pens and watches. Um, and they have all kind of signals like heart rate and acceleration data that are broadcasted through the phone or some kind of uh, gateway uh, to the cloud. Uh, then we extract and clean this data in order to create the detection algorithms. So the detection events are coming back to the cloud and then are sent as notifications to a caregiver application. So if someone lives in a nursing home, uh, the nurse who takes care uh, or the, uh, other staff can uh, see in uh, their tablet or uh, on their phone um, all kind of notification of the algorithms I just explained. So this is our problem. And actually one day, um, one of our client um, raised a request. Um, they asked us to provide a kind of emergency button mechanism. Um, they wanted it because so the elderly people could call and help, not just relying on our algorithm, just in all kind of emergency situations, uh, such as fire alarm or something else. So uh, great, the watch I wear actually has a physical button, you can see it there. Great, so mission accomplished. Well, not really. <laughs> Apparently, when you push this button, nothing is really happening. Um, no alarm is set, and the only thing that happens actually is a really short uh, vibration. Yes, uh, this is exactly like if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make any sound? So, of course, we thought of talking uh, with our uh, watch provider in order for them to help us to find a solution for that because we really wanted um, to use this button on the watch. Um, but they said to us that they cannot do it um, because they don't have the SDK. Um, <laughs> so we started to think about other possible solutions. Um, the first solution we thought of was a necklace with a physical button. The problem with that solution was that it's actually uh, really um, make the product, the product expensive and can uh, confuse and bother the elderly people that now have to wear uh, two wearable devi devices instead of one. So another solution that we thought of that actually uh, we implemented was create uh, some kind of tapping uh, mechanism on the screen on the screen of the watch, like uh, tapping one, two, three, four, five to set the alarm. But of course, we're talking about elderly people, and our client didn't like this solution either because you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. So we still have a problem. Okay, so my boss, the VP R&D, came to me and said, hmm, Dana, what do you think about trying to predict the um, emergency call from the button vibration? And I like said to him, hmm, do you mean like extracting the acceleration signals that are coming back from the button vibration uh -huh. into the watch and by that predict uh, the emergency call? He's like, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> Okay, 
you can imagine my first response was, what? This is crazy. It's not a data science problem. It's an SDK problem. So please talk with a watch provider again and push them harder. <laughs> And uh, he said, yeah, of course, I'm going to do that again and again and again. But meanwhile, um, please, you should at least try, because this is our, our best chance for the time that left to provide the solution. I thought about it <laughs> and said, OK, it's kind of interesting challenge. It's crazy one, but uh, an interesting one. And accepted the challenge. So those are some of our uh, positive examples. You can see here the acceleration data of x, y, and z, all the three x's of the space. And what else you can see here is the actual vibration is, uh, is taking <coughs> just half uh, a second. So it's actually really difficult if you can see here, just you can see here the half a second of the exact button push. Some other examples. So it's kind of hard and diverse examples. And those are the negative examples. Um, this is pretty easy, it's just the hand is still, it's very, um, easy to differ it from the positive examples, but those examples are, are quite difficult ones. So what I actually did uh, is to take all the signals, to concatenate them to one vector, uh, and try it in different kind of um, windows, frames of the data. What you see here is uh, about just three seconds, but I tried all kind of uh, numbers in my algorithm. The algorithm that I first uh, thought, to, uh, thought of to use was uh, logistic regression. And the reasons were that it's actually a really, really simple one. Simple model that you can um, easily implement in a mathematical equation. And since I didn't know where uh, eventually the algorithm is going to be implemented, um, it's a really nice solution because, because a mathematical equation can be implemented on the phone, on the watch, or on the server. Um, another thing that I mentioned was that I actually had a very short time to collect the data. So what I thought of doing is to take every um, button push example and kind of duplicate it by moving the sliding window in few frames, uh, let's say 10 samples from each button push. Uh, the problem with that is that when I split the uh, data set into a training set and the validation sets, um, it's probably um, that I will contaminate, contaminate my validation set since a lot of the data that is in the training set are, will have very uh, similar examples in my validation set. So that's not good because it's overfitting. Mm -hmm. So in order to solve this problem, uh, scikit-learn has the, uh, an uh, excellent algorithm called group cross-validation. Um, so in order to explain the algorithm, let's assume uh, every button push has only one feature, x, you can see here. And let's assume we have 12 examples of, um, oh, sorry, I have only four examples, two of button push and two that are not. Uh, for this example, I just multiply every uh, button push uh, into three samples. You can see the first uh, three samples are positive and belong to the same group one. Um, the second, uh, the, sec the uh, next three samples belongs all uh, to the group two, and they're all, all uh, negative, and so on. <coughs> so just for the, the example, uh, if we um, want uh, two splits for our uh, cross-validation, um, the algorithm will make sure to separate um, 
samples that belong uh, to put samples that belong to the same group in the same set. For example, the first six uh, samples will go in the first split um, to the first set and the last six samples to the last set. And <coughs> for the other split, um, the same but opposite way. So those are the initial results of the setup that I uh, explained to you. Uh, you can see here that actually um, my uh, true positive rate that the algorithm uh, managed to predict is quite good. It's only about 4% of uh, false negative rate. Um, the recall here, if you calculate it, it's 96%. So it's I did very good on the positive set. And um, the problem here is actually the negative set. Because you can see here that uh, the false positive relative uh, rate, the false positive rate, the relative number from the entire set is quite high. It's about 12%. Uh, the way that I uh, um, decided to uh, choose the model was to use F1 score. You can see here also this is uh, the, the, um, the measurement uh, is quite good for initial results, I think. Uh, and the reason that I chose um, specifically this measurement is because the F1 score, if you play a little bit with this equation, you can uh, prove yourself at home. <laughs> you get a representation for the actually uh, three interesting numbers. Uh, the true positive, the false positive, and the false negative. Uh, in those kind of uh, problems in the real world, like a button push, when you have a lot of negative data, and uh, most of the data, I uh, showed you one example that was really simple to predict, and most of the data looks like this. I actually, I'm not interested in the true negative uh, number because uh, those are most of the examples and the algorithm uh, can handle it quite well. So this is why I really like F1 score in those kind of problems. After uh, doing some math, <laughs> I actually realized that the 12% uh, false positive rate uh, means that uh, I'm going to get um, 180 wrong predictions uh, every minute per user. And it's quite bad, right? So um, actually, I got much less. I got only four false positive uh, um, predictions every minute per user. And only if I really tried to create a false positive um, event. Um, how, how do I know it? Because in order to check how, I, uh, how the algorithm uh, is doing in the real world, um, using <coughs> in the help of our, uh, of our client side developer, um, we implemented the logistic regression uh, prediction, prediction equation in Java. So this is a Java code, but since we're all Python developers, we can just skip it. <laughs> and this is the interesting uh, part. So after implementing uh, the equation in Java, I now realized, OK, great. Now uh, I can create a mechanism of online tagging, meaning I now can collect a lot of negative data that will help me to improve the algorithm faster. Uh, this is actually uh, one of our application screen. And this is the, the virtual button that we created. So that allows me um, to tag quickly the negative examples, meaning um, if there is a constant flow of negative samples, um, <coughs> only if uh, they are actually not negative, actually a button push, I can uh, confirm them and tag them. Other examples are automatically tagged uh, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, application to be negative. So I can 
like this, collect a lot of data and come back and train my model again. Another thing that I realized was that now, not only uh, that I can do uh, online tagging, I also could do online learning, personalized online learning for the user that um, wear the watch. <coughs> so you can see here just a simple mathematical equation that updates uh, online the uh, logistic regression equation. And that helps me, helps me not only uh, thinking of the uh, algorithm as offline algorithm, but actually um, improve my coefficients while going, while wearing the watch. So what I decided to do with all those great ideas <laughs> is to um, go to grandma on weekend and experiment with her. <laughs> I wanted to see actually how uh, elderly people can, uh, if they find and push um, correctly the button, and my uh, grandma did very well. And she has a lot of patience, so we collected a lot of positive data. Um, while she was cooking, sitting, laying, eating, and all kind of uh, normal activities. Uh, meanwhile, we also collected massive amount of negative uh, data. Do you think uh, there was a happy end for uh, this project? No. This one, the alarm, I just set it by pushing the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's not my solution, actually, sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, after we pushed the uh, web provider uh, enough, uh, they managed to think about, together with us, about uh, a solution that <laughs> set the alarm. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, despite the tragic uh, end for my solution, <laughs> I actually learned a lot from this project because now I understand very uh, well the client side of uh, the project. I experienced with uh, group cross-validation. I had great ideas for other projects of us. And the most important thing, I'm here to um, lecture you about this project <laughs> in PyData. <laughs> Thank you. Does someone have any questions? Yeah. Because you, you saw that there were big spikes when it vibrates. Yeah. So if you do the derivatives and then just put a threshold. Yeah, so I didn't explain, not the derivatives, but what I did is just to put uh, all the numbers into their absolute values. Uh, this uh, made the algorithm learn uh, much better. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, two notes. First of all, it sounds like a classical problem for uh, LSTM or recurring networks. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I also thought about this. Uh, I actually wanted to do it next, um, didn't get to it. But the reason that I uh, started from the logistic regression, is, as I explained, was that I didn't know where it's going to be implemented. And for me to take a, I don't know, deep learning uh, uh, package and then to try to implement it on the phone, it's <coughs> probably pretty hard. So I just wanted to start with a simple uh, model. Anyone? Uh, have you tried a different uh, classical uh, algorithm? Um, I didn't get to it either because I thought, uh, and, and um, another thing, uh, that I thought of was that actually uh, it was reasonable to think that uh, the pattern um, of the signals of the of my feature will have uh, like uh, probably linear or some simple correlation with the outcome. Okay, so I didn't want to start and uh, try um, difficult model before uh, I finished to explore a simple one. Uh, I thought that what uh, I uh, saw that what really helped is adding more data, cleaning it, uh, thinking about uh, thinking about um, how to make the positive um, set uh, larger. Okay, thank you.